Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website. Would ask our guests here in house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been muted as we prepare to begin. Even the speaker, that's impressive. <laughs> Our internet viewers are also reminded that you can send questions or comments at any time simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation for your future reference. Hosting our special guest and introducing our program this morning is David Azrad. Dr. Azrad is director of our B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. David? Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation for one of our two annual Russell Kirk Lectures. That we are on our way to becoming Europe has become axiomatic for many on the right. Dire warnings about America's creeping Europeanization have become a staple of Republican fundraising letters, AM talk radio shows, and the conservative blogosphere. Europe, once the cradle of Western civilization, has become a dirty word. And with some reason. On the whole, European nations are not in good shape. They face, or rather, they refuse to face up to, stagnating economies, declining birth rates, and throngs of unassimilated immigrants. It's easy to see why becoming Europe has become a cliche. But as with all good cliches, many of those who use it haven't thought much about it. Europe many complacently assume on the right, is just an undifferentiated, homogenous blob of socialism. The many poignant counterfactuals are conveniently ignored. No one seems to have noticed, for example, that France is the only Western country to have strongly pushed back against the state-imposed redefinition of marriage, or that no European country, with the lone exception of the, Le the Netherlands, allows elective late-term abortions as we do or that Sweden has one of the most ambitious school voucher programs in the world. The cliche, then, is in some need of more careful examination. As the song goes, there's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear. To help us shed some light on the European predicament and what America can learn from it, we are honored to have here with us today at the Heritage Foundation one of the world's leading conservative philosophers and public intellectuals, Roger Scruton. Roger Scruton is uniquely placed to help us learn from Europe's current malaise. He has lived and traveled in both the US and Europe. He knows English, French, Italian, German, and Czech. More importantly, he has devoted his life to serious, deep thinking about all the important questions. He's the author of over 30 books, both academic and popular, that cover everything from conservatism to music, architecture, aesthetics, the new left, religion, philosophy, urbanism, and environmentalism. He's published poems, a novel, and even composed an opera. Roger Scruton has refused to specialize. After all, no specialist can attempt to make sense of the whole. We've invited him here to help us think through more clearly and more deeply what the future of European civilization holds so that we may learn from it. We've asked him to help us identify certain hidden strengths which we may possess, strengths which we perhaps take for granted but that a foreigner might notice so that we may learn to cultivate and harness them. Please join me in welcoming Roger Scruton. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Azarad, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation for inviting me. Uh, this is a very difficult task I've been given, to examine the future of European civilization and to draw lessons for America, and I suspect that I've failed, uh, but at least it will be over relatively quickly, uh, and there'll be time for some questions, I hope, afterwards. I'm going to read what I've written because uh, it is such a nerve-wracking topic. In, in a gloomy but strangely enthralling book published at the end of the First World War, the historian and polymath Oswald, uh, Oswald Spengler 
wrote of the decline of the West, arguing that Europe was moving inevitably to its end, according to a pattern that can be observed among civilizations from the beginning of recorded history. Each historical superorganism, he argued, displays its distinctive and defining spirit through its culture. That of the West is Faustian, involving an outgoing and conquering attitude to the world, displayed in the science, art, and institutions that came to fruition at the Reformation, spread themselves far and wide through the Enlightenment, and then reached a crisis at the French Revolution. After that great period, things began to ossify into rigid, legal, and bureaucratic forms. Thus was born the period of civilization, typified by Napoleon's new rationalization of the old spirit of France. <coughs> Culture leads to civilization, which in turn leads to decay and then death. The culture of the West, Sprengler argued, will dwindle to a purely mechanical simulacrum of its former greatness before disappearing entirely. In the wake of the First World War, Europe was more than normally receptive to stories of its doom, and Spengler was eagerly embraced by the reading public. Uh, despite a polemical attack from G.K. Chesterton, his brand of cultural pessimism survived to gather momentum with the outbreak of the Second World War and to exert a mesmerizing influence over the post-war literary world. Many of Spengler's arguments are sophistical, many of his facts invented, and many of his comparisons far-fetched. But it is difficult on reading him now to think that his prophecy of doom was entirely unfounded. In one particular, he has surely been proven right, which is that the culture of Europe is destined to become an empty shell held in place by rigid structures of law and bureaucracy around the void where art and religion were once enthroned in splendor. In one particular, however, uh, Spengler seems to have been wholly off-beam, and that is America. His Eurocentric vision is focused, like that of Marx, on the great turning points in our continental history, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution. He has nothing or nothing significant to say about the other revolution that preceded the French by 13 years and which led to the founding of the longest-lasting democracy that the world has so far known. The American Revolution was, for Spengler, a distant commotion like the bursting of a supernova light years away in space, a tiny pinpoint of light in the ambient darkness. But the nation that was born on these shores has proved itself more resilient, more creative, and more able to sustain its defining mission than any other in the modern world. It is, of course, tied to Europe and to one European country in particular by language, history, culture, and institutions. It is a product of the European di diaspora, and in particular of the English religious and political inheritance. The American Constitution does not make sense without that inheritance, and is in one interpretation simply an attempt to transcribe into a document the civic freedom that the English won for themselves over centuries of common law government. Nevertheless, uh, the American Revolution was in itself a move away from Europe, an attempt to embark on a different kind of history from those that had prevailed across the ocean. And although the ties to Britain remain, it is not possible to predict the condition of America from the facts presented by Europe. It could be that the rapid and radical decline that we witness on our side of the Atlantic has no equivalent here. Or if it has an equivalent, it would be presumptuous to assume that the American decline can be understood outside the special context provided by the history and self-image of the, of the United States. So let me summarize some relevant facts about Europe and its civilization today. There is no doubt in my mind both that Europe is now profoundly threatened and also that the approach of the European Union to the threats is informed by a comprehensive failure to understand them. The threats come from both inside and outside, and the two are connected. From inside, we confront the radicalization of our Muslim populations and the loss of the core structures of European society, the family, marriage, the Christian faith, and little platoons built from those things. From outside, we confront mass migration of populations seeking the benefits of European legal order without assuming the cost. And we confront a growing military threat from Russia. In the past, that threat has been countered by the NATO alliance. But the alliance has been weakened, both by European indifference and by the isolationist foreign policy of the Obama administration. <clears throat> 
The radicalization of our Muslim populations is connected to the migration problem. Not all those fleeing the Middle East are hostile to the Islamist philosophy of ISIS. Many come ready to bear arms against their hosts, and recent atrocities in France have shown the extent to which new arrivals are ready and willing to join the cause of Allah against the infidel. As ISIS, ISIS consolidates its grip on Syria and loses what support it has among the local populations, it will increasingly seek to export its Islamist ideology and the violence associated with it. Such is, the, I think, the lesson of modern history, that revolutionary governments become stable when they can export their chaos to their neighbors. Europe has defenses against armed invasion, but it has no defenses against those who invade without weapons. The big questions in my mind are these. To what extent is the loss of our traditional religion and the culture that grew from it responsible for our weakness in the face of these threats? And what could we conceivably do now to remedy the defect? Those questions are difficult even to discuss. The European Union institutions have made a point of removing all references to the Christian religion and its moral legacy from official documents on the view that such things will constitute discrimination in favor of one group of Europeans over another. Cases before, brought before the European courts are pushing for continent-wide laws permitting gay marriage, easy divorce, and abortion on demand, as well as laws banning the crucifix from public places and curtailing the teaching of the Christian faith. These initiatives have their parallels here in America, and in the same way that liberal activists have used the Supreme Court to overrule the religion-based decisions of state legislatures, Secularists and Islamists are using the European courts to impose their vision on the nation states of Europe. This de-Christianizing of Europe is being pursued also through the European Parliament and its fundamental rights agency, charged with the advocacy of human rights at all legislative levels. The fundamental rights agency is led by activists in the cause of gender equality and LGBT rights and is inherently hostile to the traditional family and the religion-based morality that shaped it. It is now pressing for the recognition of abortion as a human right, presumably a right of the mother rather than the child. It is active in promoting the gender agenda wherever this can be brought into play, and is staffed largely by people who have spent their lives as busybodies and who have never done what my parents would have called an honest job of work. It is true, of course, that activists gather always at the top and try to push society in the direction that they favor. But their getting to the top is not independent of the fact that they are allowed to get to the top, and the people who allow them are those whom they wish to control. In any case, whatever the cause, there is no doubt as to the effect. Europe is rapidly jettisoning its Christian heritage and has found nothing to put in the place of it save the religion of human rights. I call this a religion because it, because it is designed expressly to fill the hole in people's worldview that is left when religion is taken away. The notion of a human right purports to offer the ground for moral opinions, for legal precepts, for policies designed to establish order in places where people are in competition and conflict. However, it is itself without foundations. If you ask what religion commands or forbids, you usually get a clear answer in terms of God's revealed law or the magisterium of the church. If you ask what rights are human or natural or fundamental, you get a different answer depending whom you ask, and nobody seems to agree with anyone else regarding the procedure for resolving conflicts. Consider the, the dispute over marriage. Is it a right or not? If so, what does it permit? Does it grant a right to marry a partner of the same sex? And if yes, does it therefore permit incestuous marriage too? The arguments are endless, and nobody knows how to settle them. Things are made more complex still by the inclusion in all European provisions of non-discrimination as a human right. When offering a benefit, a contract of employment, a place in a college, or a bed in a hospital, you are commanded not to discriminate on grounds of, and then, then follows then a list derived from the victims of recent history on grounds of race, ethnic group, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and whatever is next to be discovered. But all coherent societies are based on discrimination. A society is an in-group 
however large and however hospitable to newcomers. Non-discrimination laws effectively tie the hands of the indigenous European communities, forbidding them from offering privileges to their existing members, while permitting every kind of discrimination among the incoming migrants. It is natural for an immigrant family to offer jobs to its own members, to discriminate on grounds of race, ethnic group, religion, and without necessarily mentioning, mentioning gender and orientation. Hence, European city cities are increasingly places of tightly knit immigrant communities with fiercely defended territory from which the fair-minded indigenous inhabitants are excluded because they will not and cannot offer privileges to their kind. We are witnessing, in effect, the removal of the old religion that provided foundations to the moral and legal inheritance of Europe and its replacement with a quasi-religion that is inherently foundationless. Nobody knows how to settle the question whether this or that privilege, freedom or claim is a human right. And the European Court of Human Rights is now overwhelmed with a backlog of cases in which just about every piece of legislation passed by national parliaments in recent times is at stake. This development has led, however, to a sudden burst of Christian nostalgia, not only among the older generation, but among young people too. There are evangelical movements in the cities which reach out to the young and attempt to include them in a purified Christian vision. This new evangelism is not opposed to the official rights culture, but carves out a private space within it, a space where, taking advantage of the permissions granted by the secular order, the old discipline can be adopted as a personal cross. This privatized Christianity can be found in surprising places. One of them is worth mentioning since it concerns the art form that more than any other expresses the Faustian spirit of Europe, as Spengler discerned it, namely music. Following the example of Messiaen in France, a new generation of composers has emerged eager to compose liturgical and spiritual music, usually quite difficult music that will be heard only in the concert hall but nevertheless, music with the old message, written in defiance of the secular culture. Notable in Britain is Sir James Macmillan, whose knighthood recently bestowed is a sign that this way of reviving Christian values does not offend the powers that be. Macmillan is a Catholic Scot. His predecessor as the voice of Christian music in Britain, Sir John Tavener, was a Greek Orthodox Englishman and Macmillan's most important rival for the ear of Christians in Britain is John Rutter, who is an Anglican, wedded to the old, harmless, half-believing rites of our national church. <laughs> I mention these people because they exemplify a phenomenon that can be encountered all across Europe, which is the search for the old god of the continent in the sacred buildings, liturgies, and music of our various churches even and especially among people who don't set foot in a church on a Sunday for fear of being trapped into prayer. Um, the, the marks of Christianity have therefore not been rubbed out from the high culture of Europe entirely. There are still poets, composers, painters and sculptors who accept the old role of the artist as the one who praises God in the name of his fellow human beings and who represents their dignity before the throne of the Lord. Another interesting effect of the rights pandemic is the increasing turn of young Muslims to a fervent Salafist version of their faith. The rights idea leaves everything that is most important in the life of a Muslim without official endorsement. In everything to do with sex, marriage and the family, in the operation of the law, in the division of the day and the hours of work and recreation, the Muslim heart is at odds with the new official Europe. Had Christianity retained its status as the foundation of domestic custom and public law, it would have been easier for a Muslim to accept the European order. Our way of life would have seemed like a form of obedience and a human adaptation to the will of God. But the foundationless idea of human rights leaves the Muslim no alternative but to dismiss the secular law entirely as an impertinent attempt by human beings to usurp a privilege which is God's alone the privilege of guiding us to our salvation. We see in the young people eagerly traveling to Syria to join ISIS, in the growth of religious schools and unofficial Sharia courts, and in the wearing of the hijab and where permitted the niqab and the burqa, 
a defiant Islamic culture that refuses to belong to the European order and which defines itself increasingly against that order. One interesting side effect of this has been the trafficking of vulnerable girls, girls from the infidel community, an effect that has been devastating in our English cities. I have touched on this matter in my recent novel, The Disappeared, in which I attempt to show some of the fault lines between the new Islamized underclass and the surrounding culture of nothingness. Another, another interesting side effect of Islamization has been the growth of anti-Semitism in Europe. It was inconceivable in my youth that anyone should voice an anti-Semitic sentiment, still more inconceivable that he should exhibit violence, contemptuous language, or any kind of assault towards others on account of their Jewishness. This has changed, and changed almost overnight. Of course, people say that it is all the result of the bad behavior of Israel, but what is now considered bad behavior is precisely what was cheered on and endorsed a decade ago. The real cause of the new wave of anti-Semitism is the growing self-confidence and numbers of the Muslim minority, a fact that you cannot publicly declare in Britain, still less in France or Belgium, for fear of provoking the charge of Islamophobia and even the threat of legal action. So much for the rights culture, which displays its foundationless character precisely in the matter for which it should put itself aggressively on display. It is precisely the advocates of human rights as a social panacea who are the most ardent in seeking excuses for anti-Semitism. This brings me to the external threats to Europe, the one explicit and obvious, which is mass migration, the other implicit and insinuating, which is the growing military readiness of Russia. The migration problem has been exacerbated by three factors, the instability and violence in Africa and the Middle East, the welfare culture of European nations, and the effect of the EU's mo mobility provisions, which have made it impossible for member states either to control the movement of people or to affirm national loyalty as the sine qua non of residence. Looking back on it, we can see that when the original participants signed up to the Treaty of Rome in 1954, the idea of free movement of people would have had no perceivable consequences. The small number of adjacent member states who signed the treaty enjoyed the same prospects for employment, housing, welfare, and the rest. Nobody would particularly want to leave unless his job required it, and there was no dominant language that gave the key to all foreign parts. Now, with the expansion of the Union, that provision in the treaty has become the cause of massive disruption, the flight of the educated elite from Eastern Europe, the overwhelming of the welfare systems in Western Europe, and the crowding of millions of migrants into Britain and Ireland, the only European countries where the international language is spoken. The most important consequence of this is that if a migrant can make it to any country in the Union and somehow, it is never very difficult, gain the permission to reside there, he can then migrate on to his country of choice. The result for us in Britain is the breakdown of our welfare system, the destructive overloading of our infrastructure, the collapse of a precious planning system that had served to keep the country looking roughly as it always, had always done during the decades since the Second World War, and last but by no means least, the total destruction of our state schools, in which city teachers have to teach classes of children for whom English is at best a second language, and in which topics like national history, English literature, Christian scripture, Latin, and music appreciation have next to no meaning even though they are or were the foundation of everything that England once was. That this problem has been exacerbated by the EU is an understatement. It was created by the EU and by the destructive attempt to govern a continent by a treaty, so bypassing the legislatures of all signatory states. A treaty can be amended only by a laborious process and only assuming the consent of all the original signatories. It cannot, by its nature, adapt to changes that occur with the rapidity of wars, natural disasters, and mass migrations. There is no way, in my view, that the EU could now adapt to the inflow of unwanted migrants, and it therefore responds by pretending that the migrants are really wanted, that inward migration is an economic benefit, and that no other factor needs to be considered. This is the message sent out to the world by the German political class, and the extraordinary fact is that, is that it comes from a nation that once destroyed Europe in the name of its own search for Lebensraum. <laughs>
All of Europe is now waiting for the politicians to come up with a policy that will solve or at least ease this problem. But because the EU is construed as a business deal, though a merger rather than, as it was for Napoleon and Hitler, an acquisition, it cannot address the cause of the problem. People are migrating into Europe because conditions are intolerable in much of the Middle East and because there is no cost but only gain for those engaged in people trafficking. Had the EU taken the form of a military alliance rather than a social and econ economic merger, it would perhaps ha have been able to respond to ISIS, to the breakdown of order in Libya and to the situation in Iraq. For these are, for European civilization, military issues to be solved in the end by force. But without American leadership, which vanished with the election of President Obama, Europe is unable to involve itself in policing those parts of the world that are exporting their chaos to Europe. The failure of Europe in this matter illustrates the application of the second law of dynamics. Entropy, that law says, is always increasing, but can be made to decrease within a closed system. The active policy, policy of the EU, which has been to dissolve borders and renounce the use of force, has created an open system without the resources to counter the entropy pouring in from outside. The same weakness is manifested in the confrontation with Russia. Putin has understood that the outer borders of Europe are porous and that the withdrawal of American interest is now more or less inevitable, given the failure of the European leadership to understand the need for it. Having seized parts of Georgia, the Crimea, and eastern Ukraine without any real cost, other than sanctions that mean as little as such sanctions always do, Putin is beginning to probe NATO defense lines in the Baltic states and eastern Poland. The farcical peace treaty in the Ukraine, negotiated by Merkel and Hollande in Minsk, shows exactly how pointless in such circumstances is diplomacy when not backed by the threat of force. In every way, Putin is being presented with the image of Europe as a military pushover and responding accordingly. Of course, the Russian elite won't want to bomb London since they own it. Uh, and that, that true being a, too being a consequence of European Union laws which permit such things. However, it seems that the Russian army's strategic planning has shifted ominously from escalation to de-escalation as the central strand. So I learn from contacts in Polish intelligence. In other words, not invasion followed by the threat of a nuclear bomb, but a nuclear bomb <coughs> followed by occupation. All in all, taking the external and the internal threats together, it is difficult to be cheerful about the future of European civilization. However, what I have said is not the end of the story by any means. There are signs that people in Eastern Europe, and in the Baltic states especially, are seriously concerned about Russian ambitions, and there are some of them who do not take this as just another reason to flee to London. There is a growing awareness in the European political class that if mass migration is not brought under control, Britain and perhaps other northern countries will withdraw from the Union, which will in all probability collapse in consequence. For there to be a successful turnaround in confronting these two external threats, however, there must also be a rebirth of national sentiment and local attachments. So far, the foundationless ideology of rights has wiped away the emotions that would be needed if people are to be resolute in defense of their shared assets. We see at every level the retreat from confrontation, the embarrassed refusal to affirm our patrimony or its legitimate claim for sacrifice. The only first-person plural that is officially allowed is that of Europe itself, though it is a we that few people now understand, and which has in any case been bowdlerized by the political elite. But we also see here and there the signs of social and cultural renewal. During the 19th century, many Europeans thought they could compensate for the decline of the Christian faith by attaching themselves to ideologies, socialism, nationalism, communism, Marxism. The rights panacea is the latest of these, but we know or ought to know that it doesn't work. It is only by reconnecting with our true inheritance that we can develop the kind of first-person plural that will enable us to stand together against the growing threats to us. I mentioned the encouraging example set by English composers in recent years. I could mention the movement of Catholic youth in Italy around the Rimini meetings of Father Giussani.
I could mention the reaction in France, confused as yet and unfocused to the recent Islamist atrocities. I could mention the extraordinary rebirth of represent representational painting around Europe and the emergence in Britain of poets who speak directly to both young and old in a language that also recuperates our past. Even popular culture is moving in the same direction, trying as best it can to recapture the sense of belonging and enchantment, as in the film epics of Harry Potter, Narnia, and The Lord of the Rings. I don't say that these blockbuster movies are great works of art, <clears throat> but they are not repudiations of our civilization either. In fact, they are affirmations which convey confused but real guidance to young people concerning the values that made them what they are. And there are lessons in this for America. The threats confronting Europe confront America too. Mass immigration of people whose loyalty cannot be guaranteed, or who may, like the Boston bombers, see the host society as the devil's work. The purging of Christian assumptions from the law and the public square, and the replacement of them by the contradictory panacea of human rights. The unwillingness to confront threats while they can still be confronted, notably the threats from Russia and China. But there is one thing that Americans have which we Europeans lack, namely a sense of shared identity, of being included together in an enterprise, the rewards of which and the costs of which are distributed among us all. This sense of identity <clears throat> depends upon borders. It depends upon a law defined by territory and human procedures rather than by God. And it depends on the idea of the nation. Looking at Europe and at what follows when the political class loses all sight of that idea, Americans should recognize how lucky they are and how they must at all costs hold on to the belief in themselves as one nation. And if they add to that phrase the two words under God, they will be on the way to protecting the principal thing that we Europeans have lost. It is not difficult for Americans to learn that lesson. In every crisis, they stand together as a nation, and the tradition of charitable giving is as strong here as it ever was. It is well known that Americans give more per capita to charitable causes than the people of any other country. And even if you complain that 2% of GDP is not much, it compares interestingly with the 0.2% in France and the less than 0.1% in Germany. Of course, in France and Germany, the state looks after those in need. But that is exactly the European problem namely that the state has grown to replace the bonds of civil society and little by little to extinguish them. And this goes hand in hand with a decline in national feeling. Indeed, in the case of Germany, with a repudiation of national feeling among the political elite, which treads the world with exquisite softness for fear of the Nazi shadow that creeps along behind. <clears throat> Learning to value your nation as a symbol of your togetherness is in a shared land, is, in my, way the, in my view, the way forward for all who would live as citizens. It is what has disappeared from the Middle East, uh, Middle East and what is now under threat in Europe, but it is, not, it is not under threat here, and long may that continue. And this brings me, in conclusion, to a point in which Europe has the edge on America, which is the innate respect of Europeans for their aesthetic inheritance. Our landscapes and townscapes are dear to us, and have been protected through all the destruction wrought by two world wars to survive as symbols of our long-standing settlement. America is a new country whose planning laws arose from the need to build quickly and when the opportunity arose m to move on. As a result, the country is now encumbered with vast urban wastelands like Detroit. Very few American cities have a center where anyone wants to reside. Washington is one of the few exceptions. And all of them have begun to spread like a fungus over the landscape, forcing people to depend on fossil fuels and hours behind the wheel for the basic needs of life. There is a kind of loneliness that advances with the suburbs as closely knit communities are replaced with people too comfortable in their boxes to have much need of neighbors. This was not always so. Americans in the 19th and the early 20th centuries wanted their cities to emulate those of Europe. Architecture was properly taught according to the Beaux-Arts tradition in the American schools, and city fathers were keen to lay out streets, parks, and city centers as public domains in which all residents have an interest. Look at the photographs of New York at the beginning of the 20th century, or the Chicago of Louis Sullivan, and you will see beautiful townscapes and facades, public spaces, and genial details that match in every way the great achievement of Europe. 
Of course, American architects are as greedy as their European counterparts and have no qualms in destroying environments if there is money to be made for, in doing so. But the result is not appreciated by the people, as is shown by the fact that while no educated American goes to Detroit, Tampa, or Houston for a holiday, almost all want to visit Florence, Paris, or Rome. So here is one particular in which America can learn from Europe, and indeed with the new urbanism movement is beginning to learn. But it will require strength of will to resist the corporate interests and the ideological fantasies of the schools of architecture. A new revolution from below is needed here, and it should model itself on the long-standing revolution from below that we have had in England, and which I document in my book, How to Think Seriously About the Planet. We in England have taken possession of our landscape and townscape and said no to those who want to make it unrecognizable as a human habitat. The habit of saying no to new things goes against the grain for most Americans, but some no's are also yeses. And this is especially true of those said on behalf of a loved inheritance and a symbol of what we are. Thank you. <laughs> now, apparently, I'm to field the questions myself, so I'm going to try and um, do that. There are any. Yes. Hi. Uh, Andrew Kloster with the Heritage Foundation. I really appreciate the talk. Um, I share um, in many respects, and I'm sure many of us here share the um, nostalgia you mentioned and the aesthetic, the European aesthetic um, and culture and values. But I guess my question is here in the United States, um, some of your remarks might not be well received because there are those who, who don't share that aesthetic. And my question is, how do you explain to someone mm. who comes from what we might call the libertarian right, who would say, we don't need land use or planning, uh, we don't need border controls because you know America's about all men are created equal, let it all in and things will work out. So what do you mm. say to someone like that? Uh, that they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there are arguments needed. Um, it's a very deep question. There's two questions here, one about border controls and one about, um, uh, about aesthetic values. Um, the, the aesthetic question is one which is a, is a really hard one to deal with. Um, it's not that there are objective principles or universal standards. I accept that. But it is also the case, nevertheless, that aesthetics is a cooperative enterprise. It's not just a matter of having a, uh, a temporary, uh, uh, you know, t a temporary attraction to this or that thing. Uh, uh, Kant, uh, uh, who's the best writer on this subject, said that in aesthetic judgment we are suitors for agreement, meaning that we don't put these, do these things, put them forward, just saying that that's what that's what I'm doing. Uh, you know, it's no, no concern of yours. We're always wanting the agreement of others. And this is very obvious from what we do when we build our own home or lay a table for guests or just, just um, puts a bit of order into the living room because someone important is coming. You know, these, these things are spontaneous in us and absolutely vital to our social being. So aesthetic values emerge if you like, by an invisible hand from our desire for a consensus. The problem with libertarians is that they have forgotten that they also need that consensus. Um, you know, and th therefore they need to pay attention to the fact that some things are not wanted by the people on whom they're imposed. If you build a, 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 a building which is publicly perceivable, you're not changing the environment of your, uh, yourself only or the client only, you're changing everybody's environment, everybody's world. Uh, have you the right to do that? Even a libertarian might think he hasn't got the right to do that without at least soliciting people's permission. So that, uh, that's the sort of thing I would say. But about the, the open borders thing, all very well, but what if there are infinitely many people trying to cl uh, clamber through those borders? Uh, most libertarians live in secure places where only wealthy people settle down. You know, uh, uh, If, however, there was a constant flow of impoverished, needy, uh, and belligerent migrants who cross the road in front of their house, they would very rapidly become non-libertarians. <laughs> um, and I think that just has to be pointed out. Uh, sorry, there's a lady over there. 
Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Carissa Mulder. I, uh, my question is, since the United States is a product of the European diaspora and in many ways is a European power, if against all of our hopes, Europe is changes irrevocably, so it does not have the same culture, what do you think would be the consequences for the United States? It's a very deep and interesting question. Uh, um, I mean, there's so many scenarios, obviously. That, uh, suppose Europe became completely Islamized. Uh, I think America then would have to identify itself as the last bastion uh, of, a, of a vanishing civilization, uh, but you know, it would be determined probably to keep that civilization alive. Uh, I don't think it will go that far, however. Uh, what, what it's always been the case that in the back of the minds of Americans is the, is the view that, that they are an offshoot of some, something great, and that great thing still exists over the Atlant across the Atlantic. To see that great thing wither uh, and recognize that they alone are responsible for maintaining the, the memory of it will be a huge emotional shock. Um, but it isn't, won't be the first time in history um, and actually, we should take a little lesson from the most persecuted minority in the world today, which is the Christians of the Levant. Um, they kept faith for 2,000 years uh, in the place w which they thought was theirs uh, and um, have succeeded until now. Uh, so keeping faith to something is not an impossible thing. Again, the Jews have kept faith over 2,000 years of wandering you know, uh, so again, there's a, a noble example there, which when the Americans might have to start imitating, and it means changing the school curriculum, uh, and um, that will it won't be so difficult because there won't be any liberals then opposing it. <laughs> uh, it's a gentleman in the middle. There. I'm I'm having to make these choices arbitrarily. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scruton. This is Tyler O'Neill from Citizens United. Uh, you also spoke at Hillsdale College at my graduation. Uh, I was just wondering why you think Europe rejected the Christian heritage, its Christian patrimony, and is that impetus still alive today? You've mentioned it might be returning to its Christian heritage to some extent, mm. but does that impetus still exist, the one that pushed mm. it away? Well, I think uh, this is a um, question that everybody has. I mean, there are two major uh, forces behind this loss of the Christian uh, approach to, to uh, public values. One is, of course, the long-term effect of the Enlightenment. People simply think that uh, uh, religious faith has no rational foundation. It's something arbitrary. Uh, and uh, therefore we have to try and dispense with it. And the whole uh, human rights panacea it, it arises in this way because it's, it, it represents itself as something with a rational foundation that makes no reference to God. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even if that's true in, when a great philosopher like Kant expounds the idea of a human right, when an ordinary half-educated person tries to do it, it soon collapses uh, because there isn't the authority that a religion would have provided. That's, so that's one thing, that this purely intellectual thing. And the other thing is something we see everywhere in the modern world, including here in America, which is the, the uh, sheer abundance of temptations all around us. You know, we can eat and drink and make love to whoever we want. You know, there's no, no, nobody seems to be uh, standing around the corner waiting to jump on us and... Uh, and condemn us to death for any of this. Uh, uh, what, what need do we have of religion? You know, people soon discover the need for religion when they're under threat, you know, and usually when they're on the, gal uh, on the scaffold waiting to be, to be hanged. But before that time, uh, it's very difficult. And I think that so comfort is one of the problems. There's a gentleman over there who's so eager that I have to concede. Thank you, sir, for um, sharing your wisdom today and your courage every day writing, write about, the, writing about these ideas. Uh, my question is about Islam. Do you believe that it's reformable? If so, how? And do you believe 
a, con a condition precedent to that reform is a massive violent event? Well, that this is um, a very troubling question. It's very easy to argue that Islam is not capable of reform because, after all, the Quran says that. It says that this is the final pronouncement on all the matters to which, uh, which are addressed, and that's it. However, if you look back over the centuries to the great period of Islamic civilization in the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries, it was reforming all the time. Uh, and um, you know, the jurists extracted new legal provisions through their practice of ijtihad, uh, you know, the uh, practice of making uh, uh, efforts to find a, a human solution and reconcile things with the Quran. And they play down the bits of the Quran that you know, they didn't want to draw attention to. And you get in Persia, in particular among the Shiites, the whole tradition of the Sufi poets, uh, which, who are, of whom it is hard to say whether they're Christian or, or Muslim sometimes. And, and they're so sort of syncretic versions of Islam emerged. So I think that in the past it has shown ability to reform itself, but it had that ability because it was connected with an intellectual milieu and a culture. Uh, and uh, the real problem with Islam today, as I see it, is that it, that culture has been lost. All we have is a, a completely deculturated uh, community clinging to one thing only, that the holy book, which um, was written or invented or whatever uh, uh, to deal with problems that have long since disappeared from the world. What one has to do is bring back Muslims into the, into the world of intellectual inquiry. It's, uh, ask them to justify this and that. Ask them to justify this and that from the Quran. Do a bit of scholarship on the Quran. Um, and they, they resist, of course, and the, their first response is to shoot you. But after a while, uh, <laughs> shooting becomes t boring, you know, and, and listening might come in the place of it. So I think we have to, we have to cling to our tradition of freedom of speech uh, and address the, the questions that worry Muslims in an in a honest and intellectual way. This gentleman at the front. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gibbons. Uh, with the spiritual vacuum that has been left over in Europe, do you have any thoughts on uh, the way of refilling that spiritual vacuum, especially in a time when uh, religious discourse are talking about the uh, value of religion is seen as proselytizing and offensive? It is very difficult. If that's all that remains to us, to this, you know, the, this, the idea that proselytizing is offensive, then of course we, uh, uh, there is no way to fill the vacuum except with Islam. Um, and the Muslims have a huge advantage over Christians in that, uh, that they punish um, apostasy with death. So they don't have any problem about people converting away from the religion. As soon as they've converted, they've gone. Um, whereas we uh, uh, Christians do have this problem that, that we're allowed to convert, and we're allowed to convert to nothingness, which is the, essentially what we're doing. But um, you should never lose hope or faith that, th that, that people can turn back, because you can't live in a vacuum. You can't live without any source of spiritual consolation, and people will li look for it. Uh, uh, you know, and it's hard to know what form it will take. Uh, and in particular, you know, will it uh, occur within the established churches or not? And I have no answer to this. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not the Pope, um, which is a pity because I would be much more sound than him. But, um, <laughs> my, but my only problem is I don't believe. <laughs> well, at least I don't believe what he believes. But, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, we might as well hand it uh -huh. over to you. Um, you made a, my name is Richard Hyde, I'm a private, I'm Joe Doak's private citizen. Um, you made a, a reference to um, representational art as, a, as one of the hopeful signs. You mentioned mm. some painters. Can you refer to some sculptors? My particular interest is, is public art and mm. statues and this sort of thing. And once you've done Henry Moore, uh, sort of like if you've done Jackson Pollock once, it's hard to build them on yeah. how do you do more Henry Moores and more Jackson Pollocks. Um, yeah. Are there any hopeful signs in the world of sculpture and yeah, public there, art? There are um, hopeful signs. Um, my friend Sandy Stoddart, who is the Queen's sculptor um, in, um, in Scotland, has um, uh, scattered 
great statues of, uh, across the city of Edinburgh, including David Hume and Adam Smith, um, and other people offensive to left-wing opinion. Uh, and uh, on the whole, it, it's been very well regarded. Uh, and he's even done the statue of Witherspoon at Princeton. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, he's a particular kind of figurative sculptor, but there are, there are others working in that media all the time, and it's growing here. There's, there's, uh, there are studio practices all over America, which I think people can find easily from the web, um, both in, in painting and drawing and sculpture. Uh, uh, so Juliet Aristide is, for instance, in uh, Seattle. Just look her up on the web and you'll feel a great surge of hope. Um, as gentleman, oh no, uh, yes. I think um, I'm going to allow two more questions, I think. Yes. yes. I haven't, uh, sorry, I'm, there's one there. Yeah. Milton Grenfell, uh, clearly a people become the stories they tell about themselves. What do we do with our bankrupt educocracy that's so anti-American, anti-Western, anti-Christian? What can be done about it? Oh, um, <clears throat> the only thing that can be done about it is to um, encourage people like me who are giving the alternative message. And, and I'm pretty cheap. Um, <laughs> A few thousand dollars a time will secure my services. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> and I don't know what else to do, but eventually I'm sure people will, will be influenced and come round to this view, to the sort of views that I'm putting across. I don't know what else one can do, it's true. I, um, it's an, uh, except one can hope, of course, that, that some serious catastrophe will occur, which will force people to the, address the question of their identity and to repossess their inheritance, because then they'll realize it's all they've got. Um, there's a gentleman over here, I think, uh, well, should be the last one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wondered about what you think of the future of religion in the United States. The, uh, one of the things that people always used to say distinguished us from Europe is the greater number of religious believers, more churchgoers, and not unrelated uh, that we were above replacement level in our Mm. reproduction. Uh, all of those seem to be getting closer to Europe now. The question is, I guess, whether that's just the inevitable and irreversible uh, trend of secularization. We're going to be just like Europe in that regard, or are there signs of uh, vitality there that could be a mm. reversal? Well, I, I think there are signs of vitality, certainly. Uh, uh, the, the existence of this audience is a sign of vitality. Uh, you know, um, I don't think I'd get an audience saying the kind of things I'd said today in London. The, there is, uh, uh, things are going in, this, in the European direction in lots of ways. That's undeniably true because uh, um, in particular decline in birth rate. In Europe it's a, a catastrophic, or well, not, not everywhere, but it, um, uh, it's, it's only not cat catastrophic because immigrants reproduce more um, numerously than, than indigenous people. But um, I think this is partly due to something that I was referring to earlier, which is essentially the abundance of things. When people live in a state of abundance, uh, that, funny enough, they no longer feel the need to reproduce. Uh, um, it, it's poor people who, who reproduce because they own, uh, their children are the only asset they have. Uh, and rich people on the whole think for 10 years before having that first child, and then of course it needs medical interventions to secure the result. Um, you know, and I think that's what we're seeing. So uh, I think if, if there were some means of introducing starvation into America, everything would go well. <laughs> I think that's where I probably have to stop because it's two minutes past one. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>